I want to welcome you to the uh, Eric Hilton Distinguished Alumni uh, Lecture Series. I'm a graduate of the Hilton College from 1986. I'm also presently uh, Vice President of Development for uh, Hilton Worldwide in North America and uh, also Chairman of the Eric Hilton Distinguished Alumni Club. Uh, today we recognize and celebrate the outstanding career of a distinguished alumni of the Hilton College of Hotel and Restaurant Management. Uh, congratulations to you, Steve Goodman, uh, for your accomplishments, and we appreciate uh, the contributions and recognition that uh, you've brought to the college during your career. And uh, I want to tell you a little bit about Eric's Club. The distinguished alumni that are here with me today are all part of a pre prestigious group that we you know, informally call uh, Eric's Club. The goal of Eric's Club is to promote the mission of the Hilton College uh, by uh, building a legacy of um, uh, student interaction or involvement with the student body, uh, alumni connectivity, and uh, financial support to the college. Twice annually, the students and faculty of the Hilton College have uh, the opportunity to hear the success story of a member of Eric's Club. This year, it's Steve Goodman. Uh, the Distinguished Chair Alumni Lecture Series, as it's known, is not just a recognition and a celebration of the career of one of our distinguished alumni, but it's also a demonstration uh, of the prospects for our current student body today. Uh, this is a great college and an outstanding current and former student body uh, and hopefully the distinguished chair alumni lecture series impresses upon all of you the potential that uh, you have in life uh, whether it's in the hospitality industry or in some other career as Steve's lecture is going to demonstrate to you today so I encourage you to take advantage of this program as well as the overall mission of Eric's Club uh, through networking and mutual support amongst alumni ranks, we can contribute to the sec success of fellow alumni, but also uh, raise awareness of the Conrad N. Hilton College of Hotel and Restaurant Management. Now I'd like to ask uh, Bob Plank uh, to join me up here. He is uh, our spring lecturer from this year, and uh, he will introduce a little bit of uh, Steve's background. I uh, also want to recognize that we have a number of Eric's Club members here today. I won't introduce all of them. Uh, I normally do, but we've got a short program today and a long presentation. So uh, if you all want to raise your hands and be recognized, uh, welcome you here with us today. Thanks very much. Bob. Appreciate that. Uh, I am Bob Plank. I'm a 1971 graduate from the first class, and my professional deal is I'm president of in, uh, Independent Marketing Alliance, a nationwide food service distribution organization with sales over $15 billion. I'm very pleased to introduce Steve Goodman, who I've known since his student days here at the University of Houston. He graduated with his degree and his bachelor's degree in hotel restaurant management in 1983. Uh, he was a great student and a part of the campus. He lived on campus in Taub Hall during his oh, entire four years. Here at the university, he was very involved with the college. He's noted that one of his great mentors was a professor here at the college, Dr. Doug Keister, who many of all of us older folks know Doug Keister. Many of you may not, but I would guess that when you look back 30 years from now, you'll have um, a similar mentor that helped shape your life. It was Dr. Keister and another of his associates that urged him to do his master's degree in finance, which he did at the Bauer College, finishing that up in, uh, I think, 1985. I may have that wrong. But he was a student t uh, teacher, uh, TA for Dr. Dr. Keister during that time. Now he grew up here on campus during the 80s, sort of the uh, the disco era. So I call him Mr. Boogie Nights today. So. Uh, upon graduation, he went to Ernst and Young, and uh, and then after that, founded the fin Goodman Financial Corporation, which is a fee-only money management firm. Also, another company called Miramark, which he ran for several years, which was a hotel, estate, real estate investment firm. Uh, he is a, C a certified public accountant. He's a certified financial planner. He served 
the university in numerous roles, uh, being an officer, a president of the Alumni Association with Hilton College, being on the board of the University of Houston Alumni Association, having received the uh, Alumni of the Year Award from your college, and also a Distinguished Service Award from the University of Houston for his work with the university. Likewise, in his professional field, he's been CPA of the Year here in Houston, president of the local association, president or chairman of the, of the statewide association, and a member of the national board of directors of the group for CPAs. He's had a financial uh, degree, uh, excuse me, success that's quite notable. And uh, he's also been involved with the Texas Restaurant Association, Texas Hotel Motel Association in leadership roles. Steve has uh, three children, one of whom, his oldest, is actually a cougar. He's happily married. Uh, he works in his community, and he works for his university. Steve Goodman. Good morning. When I do speak, I, I try to make it uh, both uh, entertaining, uh, enjoyable, informative, hopefully inspiring in some small way. Uh, I feel if I, in the morning, if I, if you haven't had enough coffee and I don't keep you entertained, then, then I'm going to start seeing some heads nod. And I also try to make this really a, a little bit fun, and I've got some, some surprising graphics that will just try to kind of keep uh, the mood a little bit light. I'm really quite humbled to be honored in, in, in this group because when I look at my predecessors in Eric's club, I really see a group that I think has accomplished a, a lot more than I have. Uh, what I'm also going to try to do this morning is not just focus on the good and the highlights of the career, but also focus on, on some of the challenges. Because I think sometimes we learn from challenges as much or more than we do from, from the successes. So I'm going to take us on a little bit of a journey. Um, also, my career is a little bit different, and then well, I do have some hotel experience. We'll be talking about what Merrimar Corporation did. Uh, we'll be talking about the investment management business, which is my business, Goodman Financial, and also involvement with uh, the CPA community. Not just because it's a CPA community, but it really could be any professional organization or professional society. I have a lot of experience in a volunteer role in, in the professional society of, of my particular industry. And we'll talk about why that, that can be important. Uh, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, first of all, my early exposure to hotels and the reason I was interested in hotel and restaurant management actually came growing up in Chicago. Uh, my grandparents lived in a, in a hotel called the Belden Stratford Hotel. It was right off of Lakeshore Drive uh, and actually was on Lincoln Park West. And when you arrived, as we often did uh, coming up to uh, on Sundays to, to visit uh, my grandparents, you pulled up in the car and there was a valet. And they opened the door and then you got to the front entrance and there was a doorman. And then you walked past the front desk and they always said hello. They were always very friendly. Back in those days, believe it or not, there were elevator operators. They hadn't invented the push button automatic elevator yet. And the elevator operators, they took us straight to the 10th floor. They saw us every week. We knew where we were going. It was the epitome of hospitality. We'd get off on the 10th floor. The door would open. There'd be these wide hallways with this real nice hotel carpet. And my sisters and I would just tear down that floor until we got to suite 1004. And we did that almost every Sunday growing up. And to me, that was something that, that I thought was just very intriguing. It was a lifestyle I liked. It was room service and maid service if you wanted it. If you didn't want it, you didn't have to have it. But it was something that I really aspired to. And you can see the front entrance there in the photo, uh, the outside of the building, the lobby, and also the view. And I think that view was somewhat inspiring to me also. Well, also, I had, we did a lot of traveling and stayed a lot of Hilton hotels. Uh, and, and I think, really, I was the Hilton hotels always had the special mystique. They were some of the nicest hotels and also further intrigued me. I did have some exposure to the food and beverage business when I was, and I don't recall uh, if I was 10 or 12 years old, but, but me and, and the guy across the street, we started the Sunday morning breakfast service. And actually on Saturday afternoons, we'd go around door to door, all up and down our block, and we'd take breakfast orders for the next morning. Then we'd go to the deli about four blocks away, we'd pick up whatever it might have been. And it was normally things like donuts and bagels and, and, and things like that. We'd pick up an eggs, we'd pick those things up, 
believe it or not, on a wagon. We had, you know, just a little pull wagon because we had to have something. We, we didn't have driver's licenses. Uh, and we went door to door and we charged a 20% uh, fee for doing it. And, and we used it uh, to buy different electronic things that, that we wanted at the time. Uh, also worked at McDonald's for all of three days. Um, you know, at least I can say I worked at McDonald's, but, uh, you know, I think it was when I was sent out in the rain to pick straw wrappers out of puddles that I got the idea that maybe the manager and I didn't really, you know, see eye to eye. Additionally, they had this little training film loop. They didn't have videos then, but a film loop, and it showed you that if you were left-handed, they had a special scoop for the fries. And when I asked for the scoop, he said, I don't have one, just learn how to do it with your right hand. You know, I, I, I said, well, I'll try. And then when I wasn't fast enough with my right hand, because I am left-handed, he wasn't real happy. I think that's when he sent me out to the parking lot to get the straw wrappers. Uh, worked at Dairy Queen for four months. I have a really bad memory when it comes to certain things. And I remember somebody ordering a peanut buster parfait. And I asked how to make it. And the manager said, you should know that by now. And I said, well, I don't. She said, go and look at the picture. The only picture was on the outside of the building. So I actually had to walk around <laughs> outside, look at it, memorize, come back in. I was halfway through. I was at the topping stage. I had to go back outside the building again. And, and I lasted there for probably about four months. And then I actually worked at the Hyatt Lincolnwood. And this was really an important phase in, in, in my life. Uh, I'd spent many a day in the Hyatt Lincolnwood. For, it was the hotel in our community. It was actually the second hotel, Hyatt hotel in the country. Uh, the owners of the Hyatt Corporation, Hyatt Corporation's always been based in Chicago. And this was actually a purple hotel. It was actually made of purple bricks. And everybody always knew where the Hyatt Lincolnwood was. And I had worked there. Um, uh, throughout my senior year of high school and really had some good experiences there. And I, it solidified my desire to go into hotel and restaurant management. And I did discover the Hilton College. Now you're going to be wondering why I have a picture of a car up here. I'm going to actually use automobiles partly to add some levity to this conversation, partly because I can actually follow what car I was driving at different stages of my career to see how I was doing as well as uh, really to, to kind of, it was a barometer of how I was feeling about where I was not at that point, but where I was going. And for those people who are car buffs and car people, you know, hopefully you'll enjoy some of the photos. For some of you, you're going to be looking at these photos and saying, I don't know why he has all these cars. And it's not that I'm all materialistic, I just, I'm a sports car guy. But I took off in my Chevy Camaro, and it was a 74 Camaro. I can't find my original photos, so we actually pulled them off the internet, but it was that color. And I was Texas bound for U of H. And as Bob pointed out, I lived in Taub Hall for, for all four of my undergrad years. And I had some of the most fun, enjoyable years of my life. Is there anybody that lives in Taub Hall? OK, OK. <laughs> Taub Hall was, it, it was the closest to animal house we had on campus. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. Uh, Somewhere along the, the, the way, I, I upgraded my ride to a Pontiac Firebird when the Sporty Firebirds came out. And I actually was able to pay for that because I worked summers back at the Hyatt Lincolnwood. I would actually uh, drive home uh, back to uh, the Chicago area. And, and I had the good fortune of having, just, it's just luck, but the general manager of the Hyatt Lincolnwood in that era was a gentleman by the name of John Pritzker. And for those of you who know a little bit about Hyatt Corporation, uh, A.N. Pritzker was the founder of Hyatt Corporation. Uh, J. Pritzker at that time was CEO, and uh, John's other br brother was, was president, and, and then John was general manager of the Hyatt Lincolnwood. And my summer before my junior year, uh, they allowed me to be a storeroom manager. And then when the purchasing director took his vacation, I took over as acting purchasing manager for a couple of weeks. And I got just wonderful experience there. And at the end of the summer, uh, John sat down with me, as he always did. And he, he asked me, well, you know, what did you learn? And we had that conversation. He said, now I've got a question for you. He said, there's eight Hyatts in the Chicago area. All of them order the majority of their beef from Stockyards Packing. This is the only one that's, issue, that's buying their, most of their, their beef from, from a different purveyor. Do you think our purchasing director is getting kickbacks or otherwise influenced? We don't understand why he's ordering from a different vendor. 
And my response, because I had actually served for a couple weeks as acting purchasing director and made those decisions myself, is I think you ought to be asking that question at the other seven Hyatt hotels because the reality is Richard's, which we ordered from, had the best quality and the lowest prices. So I didn't know why all the other hotels were ordering from stockyards at the time. But we had a good rapport. And, and actually, one of the funniest times was in my junior year. It was probably around February or March. Uh, in those days, the dorms had phones. We didn't have cell phones back in those days. Uh, the phone rings, and my roommate says, hey, I got a guy by the name of John Pritzker on the phone. He actually, John called me in my dorm room, and he said, Steve, you're coming back to see us this, this summer. I said, sure, you know, what, what do you have? And he said, what do you want to do? He said, what kind of courses are you taking? And we discussed it, and, and I said, you know, I'd really like to be restaurant manager. Their formal restaurant at that hotel was a TJ Peppercorns. And uh, I said, I'd really like to do that. And he said, well, let me see what I can work out. Uh, call HR, let them know when you're going to be here, and we'll see you this summer. And I got there, and I was assistant restaurant manager of TJ Peppercorns. They also charged me with opening a poolside restaurant uh, that, that summer. And about halfway through the summer, um, the manager went on a two-week vacation. And I thought, wow, I get to be acting manager for two weeks. And then at the end of two weeks, they sent him out for two weeks training somewhere I don't, somewhere in California. So I actually got to be manager of TJ Peppercorns for a month. And I remember my very last day it was late at night. I was working long hours as we all do in this business. And I'm doing the payroll and I'm observing that with all the hours I'm putting in, the bus boys are making more per hour than I was. I thought to myself, wow, that, I don't know that that makes sense. And I had my conversation with John Pritzker. We talked about me really having an interest in owning and developing hotels. And his comment is the quickest way to get into the corporate side of things, and the real estate and investment side of things, is to get a master's degree. Came back from my senior year, uh, worked as a teaching assistant to Dr. Keister, who I believe that year was acting dean of the university, or the college. And uh, Dr. Keister basically said the same thing. He said, you need to go back and get a master's either in finance or, or accounting. Uh, I did that. I graduated uh, in the, the spring of 83. Uh, won the Scholastic Excellence Award from the Hilton College Alumni Association. First time I had heard of the Hilton College Alumni Association, but it stuck with me. They were willing to recognize me for my, for my achievements. I was in graduate school through 84, and in 85 in the spring I graduated with Master's of Science in Accountancy and Taxation. Now you're going to look at this photo and say, what was he thinking? Because this was my next car. I was five months out of school, and, and I went and bought myself a Ferrari. Now, that's a pretty strange thing to do, especially for somebody going to work with one of the big accounting firms. Well, I had really high grades. And you know, a lot of people tell you that grades don't matter. And, and I know of a lot of very successful people who grades didn't matter for them, and they did well anyways. And some of the richest people in this country and some of the most successful people didn't even graduate from college. But for most of us, grades are a benchmark to getting employment, a good employment. And my high grades allowed me to be able to pick and choose and actually getting, at the time, Arthur Anderson and Arthur Young, which is now Ernst & Young, to get in a bidding war. And I created this bidding war and then I got a very high paid job, and, which is how I bought my Ferrari. Uh, they also found that I had, for whatever reason, an ability to communicate with some of the wealthy clients in the office and uh, assign some clients. One of them was making $30 million a year in their business. Another one had uh, 71 rental properties. Another one was this brother of a deposed South American dictator who lived on a yacht because he couldn't land anywhere because they would arrest him. But he owned a whole bunch of really nice car dealers around, around the country. Um, but I had a lot of exposure. I obtained my CPA in 86. And then I also said, well, ultimately, uh, I want to be in real estate. I want to be a real estate investor. And along with a, a person I knew from Chicago originally, we founded Merrimark Corporation. And Merrimark uh, was a part-time venture for me. I went there evenings and weekends until December of 86, when I actually left my job at, at, at Ernst & Young and went to join it full time. Then you can see this photo, and you say, what was he thinking? So I went from a Ferrari to a Cadillac to Danville. In fact, I think we may have a Fleetwood in that photo. But what was I thinking? Well, as you might expect, uh, a Ferrari is known for a lot of things. Its power, its speed, the torque. It also was, quite honestly, a chick magnet. And, and I actually attracted uh, a mama chick along with three baby chicks. And actually what I did is I got married in 1987. And you can't fit children in the back. There is no back seat to a Ferrari. So I gave up the Ferrari, got married. And those of you looking at the photo, 
you, you understand why I gave up the Ferrari. And those of you who are looking at me saying, probably saying, I looked like I was 16 years old. She was certainly robbing the cradle at that point. Um, also visited with John Schultz. And John's probably wondering, why do I have his name up here? But I did. I, I had John Schultz at that time uh, was an adjunct professor who taught hotel development. I had him my senior year of, of college, and, and it, was a, it was hotel development. It was a very memorable course. I was impressed with, with what he had accomplished in his career, and I called on him at Gerald Hines' interest, and his office was in what is now the Williams Tower. It was Transco Tower at that time. And I went to visit with him, and I asked him, I'd like to have some keys for how can I succeed? I've got my own business now. And he talked to me about the importance of really knowing a lot of people, the importance of networking, the importance of kind of broadening your contacts and your horizons. And he showed me these two giant Rolodexes he had next to his desk. I mean, in those days you kept little cards in a Rolodex, and I think you had like 2,000 names in there. But that meeting left a real impression. I immediately went out and I joined the Texas Society CPAs. The next year I joined the Houston CPA Society and the, also the AICPA, American Institute of CPAs. I also learned that my partner in, in real estate, uh, he was independently wealthy from his family wealth, and he didn't need to earn any money. And so it didn't matter to him whether we failed or succeeded, and he didn't have the same work ethic. And so as a backup plan, I founded Goodman Financial. I was a CPA who had a lot of experience with financial advisory and investment uh, advisory through some of my work at, uh, at, at Ernst & Young. So I founded Goodman Financial. And then I also chose to refocus Merrimark Corporation as a hotel real estate company. And you might ask, well, what, what is hotel real estate? What we decided is that if you look at hotels, uh, little tiny motels are typically sold when they're brokered. They're sold by maybe a residential real estate agent. The nice hotels, are so, the real large ones, are sold typically by some type of institutional commercial brokerage firm. But that mid-market at that time had almost no professionalism whatsoever. There were a whole bunch of, quite honestly, really flaky people trying to sell hotels that knew nothing about the hotel business. I said, well, with my hotel work experience and education, we could bring professionalism to, to that industry. And, and so we did. And what we would do is we would, we would get a hotel listing, we would understand where the opportunities were to cut costs, to raise revenue, reposition the product. We'd learn all about that hotel. And we sold a couple of hotels and we actually attracted the interest of Holiday Inn Worldwide. They had a big portfolio of company-owned hotels and occasionally they'd sell off properties and they hired us to sell a property, then another property. At one point they had us selling seven properties at, a, at, at one time. And we brokered hotels all over the country. I and mean, we had several here in Houston, of course, Fort Worth and Dallas and Abilene and Lubbock and New Orleans. Orleans and Poughkeepsie, New York, and Muscatine, Iowa, and Hurley, Wisconsin, and Colorado Springs, and Denver, and just all over the place. And on average, we, in order to sell that hotel, we'd spend twenty to thirty thousand dollars of our money, of our capital, to put together the marketing information and to market that property. And we had, we built up the force. At that point, we had four different Hilton College alums working in the firm. We all had hotel expertise, and we'd hit the ground running. When we got a new listing, we'd fly into the town, we'd kind of assess the market, we'd take photos of the competition, we'd meet with the GM, we'd take photos of that hotel from top to bottom. It's almost like a mini market study. And then we'd also come back to the office and we'd brainstorm what buyer in this country is willing to pay the highest price for this hotel, because we were hired by the sellers. So we needed to find the, the, the parties that were going to maximize the selling price. And we were very good at it. Our typical average commission was about $100,000 per hotel. We're spending twenty to thirty thousand, but you can see there's a pretty good profit margin in there. Um, it's an enjoyable time. Changed cars there, just changing eras. Obtained my certified financial planning CFP certificate. I, I joined the Hilton College Alumni Board. I, I must have joined the organization prior to that. I'm guessing I automatically joined it when I when I graduated. I don't remember making that exact decision. Uh, in 1990, uh, Houston CPA Society named me Young CPA of the, of the Year for some of my volunteer uh, commitments. In 91, I was the Hilton College Alumni President. I was put on the University of Houston Alumni Association Board and became a UHAA Life member. In 92, Houston CPA Society appointed me to chair a committee, and UH alumni put me on their finance committee, where I sat for 14 years. Uh, in 93, Houston CPA Society named me CPA of the Year. I guess after three years, they decided I wasn't young anymore. Uh, the new Cadillac STSs with the North Star engines had come out, so I wanted a bigger, faster, stronger ride. Um, in 94, Hilton College uh, recognized me as Volunteer of the Year. 
Hilton College Alumni Distinguished Alumni Award. TSEPA put me on the board of directors. That's Texas Society, and I'm still on their board. Hotel Deal of the Quarter. I've got a little on the bottom right there, an article from Hotel Business. We were, they'd recognize this Deal of the Quarter. That's actually a Houston hotel. It's what is now the Crown Plaza, Greenway Plaza, there on I-59, or US-59, between Kirby and Buffalo Speedway. Uh, that was an interesting transaction because actually that one had a big percentage commission. We actually earned three hundred and forty thousand dollars from sell for selling that hotel. That was that was a nice one. What we also were doing is I always wanted to do what I wanted to develop hotels. So what I had started to do was put together a development effort, uh, assemble some parcels, use the proceeds from some of these hotel sales uh, from the commissions to develop some properties. And the first one we opened was in Katy in 1995. That's both a good year and a really bad year. That's a kind of a turning point for, for, for me and, and for us. Um, I wanted to open hotels, and you'd think I'd open a hotel and the grand opening, I'd be all excited. I finally accomplished my goal. Well, I had made several mistakes. Uh, and this is the first time I'm starting to acknowledge the mistakes here. But first of all, we went with a bad brand. At that time, we went with a sleep-in. And, and we were one of the first sleep-ins in the country. So there weren't, nobody knew what it was. Uh, there were so many delays that by the time it opened, I was actually on a cruise ship in, in, the, in the South China Sea because I had a previous obligation uh, to take a cruise with my parents. And, and I was getting calls from the office like, okay, I'm like, how did it do? Well, we rented six rooms. Then the next night, we rented eight rooms. I'm like, six rooms? eight rooms you know what's going on here uh, and by the time I got back the, our director of, of operations who actually was a Hilton College graduate said I don't want to do this hotel operation stuff I want to go back to brokering hotels uh, because he wasn't going to get any positive reinforcement we were only renting a few rooms a night and actually we made a, a decision that we would reflag the property as a Holiday Inn Express but then we incurred even more expenses to, to do that also in 1995 uh, the current president of the Hilton College alumni was uh, actually Paul Brill, who's in the back of this room on the left. If you raise your hand, Paul. Paul came to work for us. He came to work on the Merrimark side and actually after a couple of years transitioned over to Goodman Financial. Switched to a different color, color Cadillac CTS. 96, you'd think, was a good year. I was Houston CPA Society president. Uh, I took my, my, because I was president, I actually put U of H on the front cover of their annual directory. Uh, they allow you to make those kind of decisions. Texas Hotel and Motel Association made me a board member, and the Greater Houston Hotel and Motel Association, which I think is the Houston Lodging Association now, uh, added me to a committee. Well, let's just take a pause. I've had some nice cars up here, and now I've got my 1997 Cadillac, I mean Chrysler Sebring. Well, and I didn't switch to it right then, but I'm, I'm introducing an era where I had the Katy property. It was Holiday Express, Katy, Texas. It was losing a lot of money. In fact, it had a mortgage. The mortgage was $17,000 a month. It couldn't cover its mortgage payments. I was the only one personally liable on the, on, on the, on the mortgage. In fact, I was only one personally liable on covering all the losses, which totaled $25,000 a, a month. Um, some other things went on. I was also in the process of opening up Baytown. And, uh, and I was at least smart enough to convert that to a Holiday Inn Express before we ever opened. I had money tied up in, in the Holiday Inn Express Hotel and Suites in Kingwood that we were about to build. I had taken and was trying to buy a historic hotel in Winnipeg, Canada, had it closing to escrow and the financing never, never made it. It never closed and I had $360,000 tied up there. Additionally, in 1995, I moved to a 5,000 square foot house, which has all the costs associated with a 5,000 square foot house. Uh, our oldest daughter went off to private school, uh, to private university, before she finally saw the light and transferred to U of H. Uh, I did sell the Kingwood, I mean the Katy property, and when I sold the Katy property, I sold it for $300,000 less than we, we owed on it. And, uh, and I was the only one who was responsible for that $300,000. So you can see that I had some, some, some money going out the door. Additionally, the hotel development effort had consumed my time, and so I wasn't putting as much time in the hotel brokerage. And additionally, our biggest clients, we'd sold so many of the hotels, and actually two of our biggest clients merged together, and they stopped selling hotels. So when, you're, when you only have a couple customers and they, and they stop doing business with you, then you've got a serious problem. Well, we brought in, on Baytown, we brought in Nick Massad's company, American Liberty Hospitality, to 
partner with us because I knew we weren't going to be managing properties for long. We, we, it just wasn't meant to be. Um, brought him in and, and actually it was a very stressful starting use. We, we opened up slow. Uh, I think we had split the functions to where I think, if I'm not mistaken, we were paying the bills out of our office. They were, they were receiving the cash and we were receiving the credit cards and the accounting didn't really mesh. And when we finally turned over the accounting records, turned it all over to Nick's office, his controller at the time, Bob Spinagle, who I'm told is still with him, Bob said to me, he called me, he says, Goodman, I am so tired of your self-righteous, holier-than-thou attitude. And I'm like, whoa, <laughs> where, where did that come from? I've never been insulted like that before. And I'm like, self-righteous. I'm like, what is he thinking? Well, that kind of resonated with me. I was polite back on the phone with him. I didn't curse or say anything that was on my mind. But later that evening, I started thinking about, what is he talking about? And I was so used to achieving and succeeding and doing well and doing better that I hadn't recognized that I actually had some failures under my belt. My Katie property lost money. We weren't really doing well on our own with the Baytown property. Kingwood was, was going to be over budget. My Winnipeg deal didn't close. Our hotel brokerage clients weren't selling hotels. I had a problem on my hands. And it was actually the wake-up call that, 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 that made me say, you know what? He's right. I need to change my attitude. Um, I was also um, tre Secretary Treasurer Greater Houston Hotel and Motel Association. And actually, after that year, I said, I need to get off of this volunteer track with the Hotel Association since I'm not staying in the hotel business. We did open our third hotel in Kingwood, but I had transferred full control of that over to one of our partners. Uh, I decided that I need to refocus. I need to get a little bit more zip. Uh, picked up my BMW 330i, exited the hotel business, refocused on Goodman Financial. Because all along, Goodman Financial had been there. It was managing assets for clients who were happy with the results. They were referring more business. There was even a period of time where we weren't taking referrals because I was so busy with Merrimark. But I refocused on Goodman Financial. The Texas Society of CPAs put me on the executive board. I joined the Houston State and Financial Forum. I volunteered with Junior Achievement. Uh, Plan Giving Council of Houston and I joined. UH System Personal Gift Advisory Council was another council I joined. TSCPA named me Ambassador of Goodwill. What I was doing there is I was rebuilding those networks. Back to John Schultz's suggestion, you've got to get to know lots and lots of people. I was focusing on what I needed to do. Uh, one day, my, the warning lights in my BMW went on. I was driving to Advantage BMW, and then the new CTS has come out, and I pulled over by Stuart Cadillac downtown. I said, wow, maybe I'll get one of these. Also, as I was refocused, I was also managing my time better and recognizing that all these years, I really hadn't spent enough time with my family. It's not like I totally ignored them, but I didn't spend enough time. Our oldest daughter at that point had a son and actually just had a daughter. Started spending time with our grandson, Dylan, and you can see went fishing out in Galveston Bay, and uh, I think the next one was Lake Conroe. In effect, in 2005 through 2007, I really focused on growing Goodman Financial. Uh, we also, they asked us to endow a scholarship, either in my name or our firm name, and I thought, well, you know, my, my greatest mentor was Dr. Keister. I've kept in touch with him all these years. In fact, he just celebrated his 84th birthday two weeks ago. I called him and, and, and had a nice chat. He's lived in Pine River, Minnesota. He's actually just a week ago relocated to, to Wisconsin. He still owns his home there but in, in Pine River. But uh, we decided to establish the Douglas Keister Scholarship. In fact, I called Doug and I said, I'll tell you what. If you'll put up a couple thousand, I'll put up a couple thousand, I'll match you. And then I called his Cornell classmate from the 1940s, Bob James, who's an industry veteran, and I said, Bob, this is what Doug and I are doing, will you go ahead and put up some money? And my understanding, it's still in a small endowment, but I believe there's probably close to $30,000 in there. Well then, here, here's, here's kind of a rebirth. Now this photo is kind of kind of a little intimidating. This photo is a little bit obnoxious, maybe. It's funny, I, I asked one of the young staff people who, who's the PowerPoint person in my office, uh, I was having them put this together, and I said, Drew, tell me when, when, when I've got a slide that's just too arrogant or too obnoxious or too over the top. He said, the photo of the CTSV is really over the top. And, 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 and what we discovered is really the cars are not only a barometer of where I am in my career, though. The cars are a barometer of where I am emotionally, what I'm trying to do. Uh, and in fact, I purchased that car in, in late in, in December 08 as soon as they came out, and I still drive that car today. Uh, but in 08, I became TSCPA chairman. Um, 
Uh, that's a 27,000 member statewide organization with 20 chapters. I made 50 different out-of-town visits over my chairman elect and chairman year. Got to know lots of people. I actually know thousands of CPAs. Uh, my network of, of people that I know is now exceeds the 2,000 that, that John Schultz uh, had, had, had recommended. Uh, AICPA, the American Institute, put me on the Governing Council, and I'm on the Accounting Education Foundation Board. There's a photo of, of the family uh, from the dinner after I was inducted as, as chairman of the TSCPA. They also, when they do things like that, they put your face in the front of the magazine, which is a nice perk. I don't know if anybody recognizes the fountain there, but that's actually the fountain behind the Ezekiel Cullen building. I keep trying to weave U of H into these different uh, 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 activities. My wife and I standing on the balcony of our former high-rise, and then a view from, from where we live now. Now, when you look at this view, if you think back to the earlier slides, the Belden Stratford Hotel in Chicago, my grandparents' view, living in a high-rise, you can see a circular nature to this. You know, you've got the park in the foreground, you've got downtown in the background. I clearly, you know, I don't know if I intentionally came back to that or, or not. In 2010, I uh, was named as director of the Albert and Ethel Herstein Charitable Foundation. It's about a $90 million foundation that helps in education, um, uh, arts, science, um, humanities, uh, free enterprise, a variety of, of different areas. And also, I went back and finally did that uh, University of Houston endowment, Goodman Financial UH Tier 1 Scholarship Endowment that when fully funded and matched uh, will be a $100,000 scholarship endowment. Uh, you know, a, a quick comment is, if you look at the top left on all these slides, we have the little Wall Street sign. And Wall Street's been in the news lately. It's, you know, the Occupy Wall Street news. And it's funny because last week, due to my Herstein commitment, I was in uh, the Phoenician Hotel in, in Phoenix where they held the annual uh, philanthropy roundtable. It's a whole bunch of, it's not just the 1%, maybe it's the 0.1% <laughs> that's there active in philanthropy. And a comment that was made, uh, at, at that event was I wonder if the Occupy Wall Street people would feel any different if they recognize that there's 400 people meeting for three days trying to figure out how do we give away millions of dollars, not tax dollars, but voluntarily give away millions of dollars to help educate uh, people and, and how to help poor people and, and how to bring better health care to, to the masses. Uh, because I think on a combined basis there was about, represented about a hundred billion dollars worth of wealth in that room. And, and they were definitely focused on, uh, on helping people. I was there not because of my wealth, I was there because of the Herstein Foundation. 2011, where am I focused? Let's kind of get back to, to the business and what I do. Goodman Financial is a money manager. We're not brokers, we, we basically, we manage people's assets and we manage them for a percent uh, of, of, of the assets. Typically for most clients it is one percent or, or three quarters of a percent. Basically if the portfolio grows we make more money, if the portfolio shrinks we make less money. Simply a percent of assets under management. Our clients are, some of them are individuals, but there's also endowments, foundations, trusts, pension plans. Uh, one of our, our proudest clients is actually the University of Houston Alumni Association. We manage the entire endowment for them. Uh, in this uh, building, in this facility, you might be familiar, there's the Fred Parks Boardroom. Uh, the Fred Mabel Parks Foundation has its managing part of, of their foundation in, endowment. Uh, we're primarily, the people who work there are primarily CPAs and, and CFPs. We focus on money management, and then for the individual clients, financial advisory services, some of the complicated, uh, 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 basically tax efficient retirement planning and estate planning. We focus on philanthropy and, and, and giving back and advising our clients and giving back and also managing money for endowments and foundations. We have clients really primarily in Texas but also across the nation. And in fact, if I was to look at the hotels we sold in Merrimack Corporation, the map would look somewhat similar. It was kind of you know, concentrated yet, yet a little bit diversified. Uh, but we're in a service business and when you look at a service business, how do you really rate yourself. You look at client satisfaction. And the one thing we look at more than anything else is client retention. Are we retaining our clients? Are we, are we satisfying their needs? We also have to fo focus on, on track records, on how we're doing with their investments, which we do very good. But if I put the track record in here, then I'd have to have this, 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 this uh, presentation as part of my SEC compliance uh, portfolio. So I don't have that 
but you know, you see 99% for 2011. That's a pretty good retention ratio. And the only reason we have the 1% ding is not because a client left us voluntarily. It was actually a client passed away and the estate was, was distributed. And what I would say is this client retention, I think, is due to the Hilton College experience. Both Paul Brill and I, both Hilton College <laughs> graduates, we understand hospitality. We understand service. We understand dealing with people, with customer service. I think that's the reason that we've been successful. At the same time, you also have to f not forget the family. I keep going back to that. The picture of my grandkids, uh, Dylan and Chloe, who live in Austin, and then my daughters on the top right that, uh, at Father's Day, and then we've got uh, Amy and, and Sean have now little Sean, and got little Sean uh, last week uh, in the pumpkin patch. Um, I've gotten some time to do some serious fishing. <coughs> Uh, but there's some lessons learned along the way. And I'm going to go through these slowly, and I hope these are really the takeaways. I talked a little bit about the career, but the more important thing is, what did we learn from all this? Well, first of all, work hard, because it does pay off. We all know that in the hospitality industry requires a lot of long hours. But you work hard and people recognize it. Focus. This was something I don't think I did a good enough job on. I, I, I've always had a diverse focus, a little, I don't know if it's focus once it becomes too diverse, uh, but I would recognize, I recommend focus. Don't overcommit, because if you overcommit, you probably aren't going to do anything very well. You want to do things well so that people are, are, quite honestly, so that they're impressed with the results and they ask you to do more things. Don't over leverage. Boy, did I learn that. Uh, you know, I, as I said, I, I was the only one who had to pay that mortgage out in, uh, out in Katy, and it was, it was very painful. Uh, what I didn't say is that when you add all the debt together that I had guaranteed or was personally indebted, it actually peaked at $17 million worth of debt that I was personally on the line for. And that $17 million hit at a time where I didn't even have a business that was generating any cash flow. So you talk about a stressful time that was incredibly stressful, and that's why I learned, back to the second one there, focus. I learned, I said, I enjoy the hotel business, someday I'll get re-involved in the hotel business when I can do it without being over-leveraged. And then really, the compliment to don't over-leverage is don't undercapitalize. Because a lot of you, at some point, you might want to open your own hotel or restaurant or bar or club or whatever it might be. Don't undercapitalize. <coughs> If you undercapitalize, if you don't raise enough money in advance, you find you might not have enough money to complete the development project or the redevelopment re re project. You might not have enough to cover your negative cash flow until you get enough business to sustain uh, the future cash flow. I would just say don't undercapitalize. It, it, we tend to be optimists. We tend to be entrepreneurs when we open these businesses and be very confident about how we can do financially. But what you've got to do is say, well, what if things don't go right? What if you know, there's something going on in the financial markets that all of a sudden get people to stop buying. Make sure you don't undercapitalize. Now let's look at a few keys to success. Read the Wall Street Journal. Uh, if there's one thing that I could say, if you want to learn about business, you want to learn about finance, politics, the global economy, read the Wall Street Journal and read it every day. It is the best learning tool outside of the classroom I could ever imagine. Join associations, be active, and get involved. Uh, that's how you get to know a lot of people. Be nice to everybody. And I do mean that. Be nice to everybody. Whether it's a person working behind the counter at the convenience store or the dry cleaner or wherever it is, there's no reason not to be nice because you want them being nice to you. Say please and thank you. Now, maybe it goes without saying, but you know what? Often it's not said. It helps to say it. Treat others with respect. You want to be treated with respect, so make sure you treat everybody with respect. Help others, and they'll be there to help you when you need it. Don't forget your family. And empathize. Empathy is one of those kind of tricky words. It has to do with taking a look and seeing how, what is going on in the mind of somebody else. If you're communicating with somebody, what is it from their perspective? And an extension of that is consider how your words and your actions are received and perceived by others. Because a lot of us think of communication. We know what we're saying, and we say something to somebody, and we, we think we know what our message is. But it's really not important what we say as it is how it's received. Because if it's received differently, it wasn't, it wasn't any good. You have to take a look at 
who the receiver is of your message, whether it's verbal or whether it's it's written or whether it's it's a gesture, how are things received and and, oh, and perceived are, are very, very important. I mean, I think that you can't underestimate that. I say that and reading the Wall Street Journal so far are the two most important points. Listen well, because communication isn't just about speaking, it's about listening. Show an interest in what the other party has to say. Do your homework, and I'm not just talking about your classwork, but do your homework. If I had done better due diligence and better homework before opening that, that, that hotel in Katy, I would have had a stronger brand on it. Paul Brill always jokes me that if he had come to work before I ever signed that franchise agreement, I never would have signed that franchise agreement. I would have opened it up as a stronger brand from day one. Additionally, when I first went to build that hotel, there were only three hotels on I-10 between Derry Ashford and Grand Parkway. We were to be number four. Well, by the second year we were open, there were 19 hotels in that market. I never thought lenders would allow that many hotels to be built. Be prepared. I think that's the Boy Scout motto, but be prepared. People can tell when you're not prepared. Take ownership and responsibility. Take responsibility for everything. Be serious and take ownership. Take it seriously. Uh, John Pritzker used to say, excuses are BS, except he'd say the full term there. But And, and people, the employees of the hotel, were really tired of it, but he, he didn't want any excuses for anything. Others be fully accountable. If there's a problem, fix it. No excuses ever in his hotel. Acknowledge mistakes, and that's a difficult one. I, and I went years without acknowledging my mistakes, and it wasn't until Bob Spinagle basically said, I'm tired of your, of your self-righteous attitude, uh, that I really came to realize I was making mistakes, and it was a wake-up call. Be truthful. This one is, is just, just huge. Uh, in our business, we're responsible for managing assets for people's pensions and endowments and things. I mean, we've, we've got $183 million under management. And while that doesn't make us a huge company, that doesn't make us a really, really small company either. $183 million is a lot to be responsible for. There's no place in that for a lack of truthfulness. And I can tell you, over the years, I've had two employees lie to me, one in 2001 and one earlier this year. And I can tell you that neither of those employees who lied, and, and they didn't even do anything that harmed the client accounts, but they lied. And, and when you're responsible for things, there's no place for lack of truth. Because once you lie to somebody, you betray their trust and you probably are never to be trusted again. Do what you say you will do. If you say you're going to do it, do it. People are counting on you. And then set expectations, but then exceed them. Set expectations externally and exceed them, but also set expectations internally and exceed them. That is part of how you, you, you can really succeed and get to where you want to be. You've got to have a goal in the first place. And sometimes that goal will change over time. But make sure you set expectations for where you're trying to go and then exceed them. And that concludes my prepared remarks. I thank you for your attention. Do you want me to take a few questions? Okay. Any questions? In the back there. Did I ever wreck any of my cars? Actually, the only one I wrecked is that Camaro I once slid off of an ice embankment into a ravine, and it actually landed nose down with the wheels and the, the back wheels in the air, and they had to use a crane to pull it out. And it was good as new about three weeks and a couple thousand dollars later. What's the fastest you got the Ferrari? <laughs> Actually, you know, I don't think I ever took that up beyond 140. Uh, what's funny is, what's funny is the car I have now can do 200, but I've, I've also not taken that beyond 140 because I am just chicken. These days they'll throw you in jail, and and I don't need that. Any other questions? What's my next car? <laughs> I, I don't know. Actually, we joked about that in the office. I love my car now. I actually want an Aston Martin, but it's slower than my current car, so I, I don't know what I'll do. And I didn't mean to make this a, a car uh, discussion, but you know, and, and, and actually, you know, some people would say, "Well, wow, he's really materialistic," and I and I was going to say, "Well, no, I just like really nice things," which is probably the definition of materialistic. But it's 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 more of of sometimes a car. That's the the CTSV. I bought that because when I got married, I gave up the Ferrari for the kids. And by 2008, I would finished putting all three girls through college. They all have undergraduate degrees, U of H, UT, and Concordia. 
uh, one of them one of them's back in, in nursing school now uh, at UT but it was my reward for putting the girls through through college other questions Well, you say, the question is I used cars is, as I went through life as kind of an analogy to, to where I was, and, but now people want to go retro. I was actually at Philanthropy Roundtable. I, I was talking at a reception with this gentleman, and we were talking about buying things at auctions and things like that. He said, yeah, I just bought this car, and we talked about it. And as it uh, progressed, it, I learned that he's got three airplane hangers full of cars. Uh, and and uh, the reality is that's... That's a hobbyist. That's a collector. I just drive them, uh, and, and I like them to be under warranty. <laughs> Where would you like to see yourself in five years from now, with your company and with your vision? Excellent question. Where would I like to see myself five years from now with my company and my vision? With Goodman Financial, as I said, we, we manage about 183 million. I'd like us to continue to exceed the benchmarks to where we're, we're measured from a standpoint of investment performance in stocks and bonds, and, and hopefully using that performance to grow. Five years from now, hopefully we're managing a billion dollars. A uh, billion dollars, not just for the sake of hitting a billion, but a billion dollars gives me the cash flow that I can then be more active in the philanthropic areas and, and make a bigger difference in life. Uh, I'll also probably in that time frame see myself doing something in the hotel industry, maybe with one little trophy property. I have one for sale. Wait, there were, <laughs> you have one? <laughs> There's back there first? Uh, what was the name of the hotel you opened up? The Hotel in Kingwood was the Holiday Inn, hotel, uh, Ho Holiday Inn Express Hotel and Suites. It is still the Holiday Inn Express Hotel and Suites. Off of 59, Off of 59 at Kingwood Drive. I uh, bought all the land behind it and uh, developed that hotel. I actually tied up that hotel the land a long time earlier it took me a long time to get financing on that hotel I and actually there were and I'm not exaggerating 99 lenders in a row said no until the hundredth lender said yes and and we did and they financed it and and, and we built that hotel by the way the one in in Katy uh, we opened a sleep in it became Holiday Inn Express and I am disappointed to say that it is now a Motel 6. It's actually it's actually a structurally a great building and the owners of that property also developed the new Holiday Inn Express at uh, um, West, Glen, West Green Drive right across the street. It's the same people own, own both those. And the one in Baytown I've heard became a sleep in again, I, I believe. There was a question there. What is the most important aspect of controlling costs in the hotel industry? The only way you can control cost is to have good information. If you don't have good information, good data on a prompt basis, as close to real time as you can get, if you don't have that data, um, it's really hard to, to be profitable. You need data, you need information. More information that's usable, the better. You can make good decisions and, and, and do a good job controlling costs and thereby in increasing profits. My biggest success and my greatest failure. Um, Business-wise, I honestly say the biggest success, it was actually being chairman of the the Texas Society CPAs. That was a huge honor for me, and I took it very, very seriously. Uh, the biggest failure, I, I'd have to, <laughs> I'd have to go back to my entire hotel development effort. Here it is. I wanted to be a hotel developer, but we didn't just plan on three hotels or four hotels. We actually, at one point, I had a team of several people, including director of finance, controller, operations, development. We were going to build. 12 hotels, and I was funding that with overhead of $500,000 a year to fund that hotel development effort, and, and basically ended up, when I, in a net sum game, if I look at Kingwood, Baytown, and Katy, I made no money when you add all three, because Kingwood actually was a, was, a, was a great property, but you add them all together, it was a zero sum game that cost me an incredible amount of time and, and focus. Nick? Steve, I want, I want to make one thing clear, okay? We had a great working relationship. Despite my CFO and his comments <laughs> to Steve, no, I, uh, we've been close friends for a long time, and uh, I, I, I think maybe that comment was a wake-up call for Steve. But I also want to say you were a great developer. All those properties were built very well, and you were ahead of your time. More than anything, I think you were ahead of your time because all those hotels today are doing extremely well in their markets. So you know you have to really be careful about time. Yep. Uh, and, and I think all those were in markets that were emerging, but the business wasn't quite there yet. So timing is so important there when you do a business. I, I, 
I would agree with that. And also, quite honestly, we weren't necessarily a hotel management company. You know, when, when I when we recognized what we had and the time it was taking, especially for the small properties, it made sense to to have them managed by people who had some expertise in managing those properties along with with other properties. And we, we did enjoy the partnership. And I, I did ask Nick right before I came up here. I said, Is Bob Spinagle still with you? I'm going to mention his name, but I'll tell you, it was it was an insulting comment, but it was necessary. It was deserved. Right there. How important is having good business acumen in the current economy? Um, it goes back to reading the Wall Street Journal. If you can read the Wall Street Journal every day and understand what it's saying, and the more you read it, the more you're going to understand what's really going on, it's extremely important. Because, I mean, we're dealing with, with our individual clients, we're managing their entire financial worth. And with some of these foundations or endowments or pension plans, people are relying on us to do a good job. You've got to have good business acumen. You've got to be humble. You've got to learn when you're making mistakes. But, but the more expertise you have and the more you keep your eye on the ball and understand the entire environment, finance, the global economy, the more you understand, the, the better you'll, you'll do. I think we have time for just maybe one more question and then uh, I think Greg's coming back up here. Any more questions? There's one in the back. Did I consider? Well, they're, they're two different, you know, they're two very different things. You know, what, the thing that John Pritzker told me early on is, Goodman, I don't think you're a, an operations guy. I think you're a finance and corporate kind of developer and ownership guy. And I think that they're two di very different things. There's those finance people who excel in those areas, and then there's those operations people who, who excel in those areas. And you've got to see where, where your strengths are. Thank you very much. Can I get a little light up front soon? I, I brought my trusty assistant, Dean Bowen, with me here for the lights. Thanks, Dean. Um, since we do have a couple of minutes, and thanks for leaving us a couple of minutes, I appreciate that. Uh, I want to recognize some of the other Eric's Club members who are here with us today that I couldn't uh, recognize earlier. Um, we've got uh, Ricky Oberoi sitting right here. Uh, he's local. We have two former chair persons of Eric's Club with us, Dorothy Nicholson uh, most recently, and Nick Massad, our first. Welcome back, Joe Jackson. I haven't seen you in a while. Thanks for coming. We've got Dave Smalley here with us. We've got Bob Plank with us today, who you've already heard from. We have Al Gallo. Don't be shy, Al. <laughs> Bob Cowan, uh, who's with Omni here locally, thanks for coming. And our founder, who uh, at the last lecture I neglected to mention, I'm surprised I'm still here to do this, but Dr. Rapol, thank you for your guidance on this and your vision for it. Um, uh, uh, and that was prepared. I knew they were all coming. Did I miss anybody? Um, Paul Brill is here, uh, also a graduate and a colleague of Steve's. Thanks for coming. Um, today you'll have the opportunity to ask more questions of Steve Goodman uh, in Barron's at the Q&A se uh, session from 2 to 4 o'clock, so please participate in that. And thank you all for coming. We had a packed house again as usual, and we appreciate your enthusiasm for this program. And um, Steve, yours is a, a remarkable and, and very extraordinary career path. Uh, we learned a lot from your presentation today. Um, more remarkable for me is your activism, not only in your community and in your profession, but here at the university. And that's what this club is all about. Thank you very much. You're, a, you're an inspiration. Thanks. I think I need more than one hand to do this. Bear with me a second. That's because it's still taped. <laughs> Thanks, Whitney. <laughs> That's right. Now, you've got an awful lot of trophies. A trophy wife, trophy daughters, lots of awards. So this is just going to be one small dent in your uh, trophy cabinet. I know, but this is just a small token of our appreciation uh, and your uh, participation in this program. It's a plaque uh, honoring you and, and your participation today. Uh, something I'm sure you don't have in your trophy case, you're going to have to sit in, so bear with me and sit down. <laughs> Congratulations, Stephen. Thank you very much.
We appreciate you and your participation in the college. Thank you very much.